You're listening to the Plane Talking UK podcast, the UK-based podcast written by a passenger for anyone. And here are your hosts, Carlos Stevings, Matt Smith and Neville Bounds. Well, hello everybody and welcome to episode 224 of the Plane Talking UK podcast. My name's Neville Bounds and welcome to everybody. And we've got some uh, special guests on today's show and we are broadcasting live from the gazebo studio as well, <laughs> yeah, aren't we, Absolutely. Well, you know, I, li- I like to throw a spanner into the works where possible uh, and I've certainly done that, he says, starting 23 minutes late. But anyway. Uh, yes, slight are. technical <laughs> moment, but uh, we're, we're okay now. Yes, so, uh, Yes. And uh, also joining us uh, over there is Owen. Well. Hey, there, guys. <laughs> I was uh, helping uh, get Matt's house rewired. Uh, yes, yes, literally, <laughs> yes. I have. Uh, you, you don't want to see, and Nev, you would be horrified if you could see what's sort of around this table now. It was all neat. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. Uh, it yeah. was never proved beforehand. But, it um, was. Yeah, yeah. It got like appropriate cable guards <laughs> and you know trip mats and all sorts of things. Now it's just utter chaos. By uh, six minutes before the show was due to start, uh, we decided <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'd make a trip somewhere else to yeah. find. Uh, yeah, some more wires. To replace, you know, tidiness with functionality. Yes, you, indeed. Which is always, yes. Uh, you know, <laughs> always an added. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Indeed. Yes. So as you can probably tell, we do have another person who has joined us on the show and his name is the legendary Captain Al. Hello, Captain Al. Uh, Hello to you. Good morning. (laughs) Good afternoon. Good evening or goodbye, depending on where you happen to be. (laughs) Yes, indeed. Yes. Yeah. This seemed like a really good idea at 4.30 this morning, didn't it, Al? eh? (laughs) It did. Yeah. That's uh, that's 4.30 uh, Polish time. Right. So uh, yeah, that's like yesterday in (laughs) UK time. So... (laughs) Nothing yes. good ever happens after 2 a.m. No, no good point. <laughs> no. <laughs> so what have you been up to this week, Al? You've been uh, flying this week? Um, yes, I spent the first uh, part of the week in the simulator doing my uh, recurrent uh, training and checking. Um, as uh, some people will know, uh, the airline that I work for has uh, two parts to it, so uh, I have to go into the simulator quite frequently. Um, so it's a bit of a necessary chore. So I did uh, the simulator, uh, let me see, Sunday and Monday. Uh, I deadheaded out to where I am now, which is uh, Katowice, in uh, the uh, deepest and darkest part of Poland, uh, not too far from the uh, border with the uh, Czech Republic, and not too far from the border to the Ukraine. Uh, so I came out here, and I've done a few flights over the last few days, I uh, did uh, an early flight, or early four flights this morning, and now I've got a couple of days off here before doing some more flying, before heading to Riyadh next weekend. Ah, oh Gosh. yes, yes, because you're representing us next weekend, whether you like it or not, by the way. <laughs> oh, right, OK, I, I'm down, down to the, the sole person, am I? Uh, well, well, no, is Pip not? Is Pip not still going, or is he...? Uh, yes, yes. I mean, Are you sure uh, we're sending those the, two the boy will be there, but I mean, he would be wearing his uh, undoubtedly his uh, plane safety hat. Well, so yes, he indeed. Could afford to buy yeah. one. Yeah, right. one. <laughs> indeed, absolutely, <laughs> indeed. Yes. So, uh, yeah. So, brace yourselves, ladies and gentlemen. If you are going to react, then obviously Captain Al and Captain Pip, uh, not Captain Pip. I've just promoted him. Pilot <laughs> Pip uh, will be uh, floating around at react. So, if you do get a chance to make sure you uh, uh, you better take over now. Captain Pip, I'm not like Captain Pugwash. <laughs> right. Say. Okay. Good. <laughs> Uh, family show. Oh, I think he might be in the chat room, actually. Oh, is he? Uh, right. Good evening to you, Pip. <laughs> family show. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, Nev, uh, rescue, abort, abort. Yes. <laughs> but, what was uh, anyway, name? Yeah, well, actually, I guess... Oh, jerk off, that was it. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> You're talking about your Polish water again, I assume. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, my, my Polish water, which is... Uh, Cunningly titled Jerk Off. Splendid. <laughs> yes, absolutely. There's no comedy value in that whatsoever. Moving on, Nev. Uh- <laughs> right, well, we sp- as we're a bit late starting, we better get on with it, I think. We've got quite a lot to cover uh, today, haven't yes, we? So, uh, if you're ready, Al. Uh, yeah, ready as ever. And if you're ready, uh, Matt. <laughs> yeah, why not? Let's go for it. <laughs> and if you're ready, Owen. Yeah, sure am. <laughs> right, let's go for it. <laughs> Well, starting off the commercial uh, segment this week uh, is on the mix96.co.uk website, Pardon? which is our <laughs> local radio station, funnily oh, enough, okay, uh, right. near where I live. 
and uh, the headline says, "Are there... can you do the jingle? <laughs> Are you able to just do the jingle for us?" Yes, but obviously there's a royalty uh, of course, involved yes, there, absolutely. so I, I can't do it. No, um, but um, it says, "Are there too many planes over Aylesbury Vale?" Now, yes, you may know Next. that that is an area where I live. Um, the uh, the way this story is written, that I think they could have done better. Uh, but it, it just um, let me just tell you what it says. It says if you live around Aston, Clinton, Tring, or Wendover, and these are towns about sort of four or five miles from where I live. These are real towns. They're not made up places, are they? No, no, they are real, and some of them are good scores in Scrabble, but they are also very good, uh, <laughs> very good towns. Right. Well. <laughs> it says, have you noticed more planes flying over? Well, one man says that there has been a big spike in air traffic and wants looted... Painful. Airport. Yeah. I mean, that's obviously <laughs> to make sure that the controllers aren't sitting down for too long. Uh, no, of course. Yes, post the thought. And he wants yeah. Luton Airport to do something about it. Oh. In over 20 years of living in Aston Clinton, Phil Clark says he's never known so many flights passing overhead. He said Sunday was a very sunny day, so I was outside in the garden most of the day. I would say that they were continuous one after the other into Luton Airport. They were so low you could almost touch them. You could all you could see the colour of the plane. Just a point of order there. Uh, <laughs> if his arms are four thousand feet, feet long, right. yes, then that's of course. excellent that's... and well done him. <laughs> yeah, perhaps but his he... middle name is Tickle, as I... in Mister. <laughs> <laughs> and you could see the colour of the plane probably because uh, it's probably a lot of easy jet going into the <laughs> yeah, They yeah. are very distinct. Yeah. Are they? Are they, are they the, the, yes, the orange does sort of stand out quite well, doesn't Especially it? Especially with the sun out. Yes. Course, well, anyway, yeah. Phil's been uh, trying to talk to Luton Airport about this, saying it's affecting the quality of life for hundreds of people. About three years ago, I noticed a real increase in number, frequency and noise from aircraft flying into Luton Airport. They are incredibly low and incredibly noisy. It drives us made, really, it says Maid, M A D E. Excellent. Nice one. Mix 96. <laughs> the airport's Neil Bradford said that they try to strike the right balance. We work hard to strike the right balance between maximising the benefits that, that a successful airport can bring to the local community and reducing the impact of noise where possible. Our noise control measures are some of the most stringent of any major airport. And uh, these include a ban on the noisiest types of aircraft, an annual cap on the number of night flights and the lowest noise limits. In addition, we have imposed further restrictions on night flights this summer to reduce our noise footprint. But Phil told us some of what the airport has promised isn't enough. Luton Airport are also talking about this temporary night ban over the summer. Temporary is no good. It has got to be a permanent night ban. And uh, the airport added, we take the local residents' concerns seriously about noise and we welcome feedback via our dedicated noise website and regular community noise surgeries. Well, the other thing, of course, that's been happening over the last two or three weeks is that uh, the airports around this sort of area have all been on easterlies, I would imagine, so that they will be landing in the... Uh, uh, not the normal direction so right. that's probably a contributing factor to this but um you operate out of luton quite regularly al i guess Have you yeah there? absolutely um yeah. and I i'm just trying to sort of uh place uh, sort of aston klingon tring and wendover right uh, <laughs> and um i mean i know roughly speaking where where Aylesbury is. Are they all in the Aylesbury area? Would they, they are, be? yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, Tring's in Hertfordshire, uh, but um, yeah, yeah, they're uh, all within about a five mile radius, basically. So, so roughly speaking, um, how far from Luton are these towns and villages? Oh, probably a driving time, uh, 35 minutes, I guess, something like that. So probably about 15 miles. Right, okay. Hmm, um, well, if they are 15 miles, um, then as you've quite succinctly pointed out, uh, the aircraft are going to be 4,500 feet or thereabouts, um, and uh, they'll be in the landing configuration, so um, hardly at its noisiest. No. Um, so um, I'm afraid it falls into the category of tough. <laughs> 
Right. <laughs> yes. Okay. I mean, I know, um, I, I know, I know what you mean by this, though, Al. To be fair, because I mean, you know, many people will know that I, I spent significant years being a landlord of a pub, and one of the things that used to be challenging at best uh, was the amount of people who would come and buy a house that was next door to a pub, and be surprised that there might be some kind of even quiet noise occurring, say after eleven o'clock at night and be very surprised that there is the risk of being disturbed, you know, and you, you do your best to, to minimise that. But, I mean, it's like, I mean, yeah, yeah. do more than look at it online before you buy your house. I mean, if, if, if air, you know, airplane noise is going to disturb you that badly, surely you need to... I mean, I suppose it's different if you own the house and then they put an airport right nearby it or they put a, another runway in, for example, you know, which is probably what's going to happen all around, you know, Heathrow at some point, etc. But, um... I, oh, I, 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 I do sound... these people not get used to it though? I mean, living beside an airport, do you not get used to uh, to hearing all these noises very, very frequently? Well, don't forget where where he's talking about is say very close to where I am, and I, it's not. I don't think it's distracting at all. Really, it's just because the weather is what it is. So they're all on easterlies for the moment, and that's. You know, that's how it is. And when you well, look up, I, I, there's no clouds in the sky to well, hide them. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But um, obviously, Luton is a, Luton Airport, a very large employer as well in the mm, yeah. Bedfordshire and Hertfordshire area. So it's, you know, it's an important part of the infrastructure, uh, definitely. So, uh, it and it's single runway there. So there's not, mm. I don't see any sign of expanding that at all. Do you, Al? Are they very restricted uh, on, but, on space? No, no, no. I, I was just having a, a look to see where Tring was. And, um, uh, I don't know where the, the other places in the article are, but uh, Tring is actually south of the uh, final approach for uh, Luton, and most of the traffic coming into Luton tends to come to the north of Luton, um, uh, and therefore not really going to be um, over that area. And uh, uh, I mean, it, it's it's strange, really. I mean, yes, there is more traffic going into Luton for sure, uh, but I'm I'm surprised that uh, that this gentleman feels that they are so close that he can touch them. Um, <laughs> um, that that's um, not really the case. And actually, aircraft going over train um, for landing on on Easterlies um, uh, are going to be, um, as we've discussed, you know, four or five thousand feet. So no, I'm not seeing uh, that there's a huge amount of noise. Um, yes, so and, and also, of course, it, the, the, sort of, the sort of traffic that's using it, they tend to be um, modern aircraft, um, modern yeah. uh, Airbus and Boeing products and some uh, BizJet, um, all of which, I mean, I think the airport does a very good job, actually, of trying to minimise noise and they really try to be good neighbours. Mm. Yeah. Well, absolutely. I mean, aircraft going in and out of Luton fly what's called a uh, continuous descent approach. So basically... Uh, the idea is is that uh, you don't level off at any point on the approach. So when you level off, uh, you have to pr thrust on, which makes noise. So uh, all of the operators uh, are set fairly stringent targets by by the airport, um, and uh, we we try to be as environmentally conscious as we possibly can. But I'm afraid if you live under the flight path of an airport, you are going to see aeroplanes going in and out. <gasps> no. Yes. Well, do you know that's shocking? Oh, I, that's that's blow me, Al. That's a, that's a revelation. That is. I yeah. really, I'm, I'm, I really shouldn't drink, should I? I'm going to stop drinking. <laughs> 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 we, we may, we may. Yeah, mm, mm, yes. Uh, well, uh, actually, yours is the next story. <laughs> is um, it? Oh, good luck, everyone. And of course, <laughs> being the second story, we know what that's all about. Yes, it was, yes. It's probably going to be a Ryanair story. So, yeah. in the change to the advertised article, because for some reason I couldn't get past the ad blocker, so <laughs> Owen has very kindly sent me a non-ad blocked version. Uh, so this is on the Sun newspaper, obviously, where everybody goes for their AV related news and uh, the headline is and air off hmm. Ryanair strikes 2018 what dates are the July walkouts will flights be cancelled and why are cabin crew and pilots striking 
Hmm. Uh, Ryanair is set to face industrial action in July 2018. Irish trade union members will go on to st- go go on strike for the first time on Thursday, July the 12th. And now unions in Italy, Portugal, Spain, and Belgium are set to join them on the 25th of July. Here's what we know about the action. So pilots who are members of its Irish trade union will go on strike for the first time on Thursday the 12th of July in a row over working practices. Unions representing cabin crews in Spain, Portugal and Belgium will strike for two days between July the 25th and July the 26th, whilst the Italian crews will strike for one day on July the 25th. Europe's biggest budget carrier averted widespread strikes before last Christmas by deciding to recognise trade unions for the first time in its 32-year history, but has since struggled to reach agreement on on in <clears throat> on terms in some countries. Ryanair, which so it's it's a very serious story. Don't laugh. Ryanair, which flies in 37 countries and carried 130 million passengers last year, has so far signed agreements with pilots in Italy and Britain too, uh, two of its largest markets, but also experienced minor disruption in Germany and Portugal. Ryanair pilots eligible to vote in a ballot called by the Forza IA Alpa, so it's Alpa, I L A. Um, this is going well, IALPA trade union, which does not include contractors, backed the call to engage in industrial action and will strike for 24 hours. Uh, the union, which said 94 of 90 of the 95 ballots, that's quite a strong yes, isn't it, uh, returned in favour of industrial action, has advised Ryanair that it will notify it of additional strike days in due course, but also remains available and willing to engage on the issues. Some 120 unions Union members, most of them captains, are directly employed by uh, Ryanair and are able to strike, a spokesman for the union said. Around 400 Ryanair's more than around 400 of Ryanair's more than 4,000 pilots are based in Ireland. So will my flight be cancelled is the question. It is too early to say which flights will be affected by the pilot walkout. At the moment, only pilots based in Ireland are striking. However, it is one of the busiest times for parents as schools in Northern Ireland are already on their summer break. Uh, So what have Ryanair said about the issue? Ryanair said that it would contact customers travelling from Ireland if the strike went ahead and invited the union to its offices for talks. Since Ireland's account, f- uh, since Ireland accounts for less than seven percent of Ryanair's flights, we expect that ninety-three percent of our customers will be unaffected by any strike. It said in a statement. While Ryanair has also had success in Britain and Italy, signing recognition agreements with cabin. Uh, with cabin crews, some of its crew will gather in Dublin on Wednesday to demand better conditions in their first ever pan-European summit. Shares in the airline are down 21% from an all-time high last August before it had to cancel 20,000 flights over a ro- rotor fiasco triggering the, triggering the pilot unrest. So, yes, it's uh, it's a little bit watch this space, I suppose, isn't it? We're not... Uh, not enough detail is known at the moment about it. I mean, there's no doubt there is going to be an impact from the strike a- strike action, is there? I mean, that's 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 a, that's a given, really. It will be interesting to see who flexes their muscles the most, whether it's the union or whether it's the Ryanair management. Mm. It's going to be one of those very cagey games, I suspect. Yeah, and a lot of people are hanging in the balance with the holidays uh, book for that time of year as well. Uh, yeah, not not going to be good. Well, I mean, I've always said that there's, you know, there's no point in threatening industrial action on a Sunday in the middle of the winter. So, you know, if, <laughs> you, if you're going to, as a union uh, or as a, as an employee group working for an airline, going to flex your muscles, then uh, then the summer is definitely the time to do it. And why not go for a peak summer? Um, so, uh, if it happens to be one of the busiest uh, periods of time in in Ireland, then go for it. Um, but uh, uh, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Um, uh, I think it's probably fair to say that uh, Ryanair management have played kind of uh, hardball with, with uh, unrest in the past. Uh, but the pilots, you know, they, they, they have a strong bargaining position. And, um, you, you know, We've already seen that there's been a rippling effect of uh, Ryanair having to uh, acknowledge that they're legally obliged to enter into agreements with unions. And uh, now, of course, they're therefore obliged to enter into negotiation. 
And I think it will be very interesting to see who is able to play the ace in this game of poker. And what media coverage comes out of it afterwards. Mm. I'd be um, kind of interested to know what sort of... uh, what sort of press coverage they get um, about the result of the strike as well. Because it, these uh, things always absolutely. tend to be hyped up at the start and um, before the strikes and everything, but um, very little comes after. Uh, so it'd be interesting to see if uh, they publish anything like that. Yeah, and it's also interesting because um, uh, Ryan are downplaying it and saying that it's uh, only 7%. But mm. that's quite a reasonable amount. If you were to, you mm. know have 7% of your bank balance taken away, you'd want to know all about it, wouldn't you? Right, 7% of about 20 quid is... <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, all right. I should just say, apologies uh, during the show, though, there seems to be some unrest in the chat room. I think that's the best way to describe it. I, I, I don't know if you're going to... Gonna, you might have to wield your blue spanner of death at some point here, Nev. It's getting a bit out of control. <laughs> yeah, well, I was thinking of uh, blocking Carlos, for starters. Yeah, well, absolutely. Or, uh, I think so. yeah, <laughs> a career-changing move, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> well, for all of us, yes, absolutely. But uh, yes, uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah. Well, well it's going to be one of those, isn't it? We're going to have to suck it and see. And as you say, I mean, uh, all right, seven percent, but that it will will nevertheless, as far as Ryanair is concerned, that will be an entire base, uh, essentially. You uh, well, know. it'll be well, more it than is, an entire it, base. Uh, it'll be an entire it country. It will also um, unsettle the investors as well yeah. because mm. they will start to look at this and think, mm. hmm, well, this, is this the start of you know, is this the tip of the iceberg? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I don't think this is the uh, the end of. Uh, uh, you know. We, I mean, even if they they agree it, I mean, you know, it's. Uh, I guess that's one of the. I say, looking at the, uh, the 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 bigger picture here, I guess that's one of the reasons why he why O'Leary has been so sort of you know anti uh, unions, like you know from the start. I mean, that's that's. Uh, I guess, uh, the thing, isn't it? Anyway, we should probably move on. Uh, who is next? Well, it's, uh, Owen is taking nah. the next I'll take the next story from uh, ttgmedia.com and this says EasyJet granted at all license for 185,000 passengers. Uh, it's acquired its own at all license for the first time. A move oh. the airline has told TTG is necessitated by the new package travel revelations. It's uh, license number 11446 was listed on the CAA website on Friday morning uh, on July 6th, that's uh, this morning, and grants the airline capacity for just shy of 185,000 uh, Atoll protected seats from September 2018. EasyJet already has an Atoll licensed tour operation subsidiaries, EasyJet Holidays, uh, though this is operated by Hotelopia, an extension of hotel beds with uh, capacity for 166,500 protected passengers. The new atoll uh, is uh, for more atoll protections uh, than EasyJet holidays can currently uh, carry. It's unclear at the stage where their EasyJet intends to merge uh, the new atoll with that of EasyJet holidays to create a completely in-house operator with capacity for about 350,000 passengers or whether the two atoll licensed operators will continue to function in isolation. Following its its, uh, first half results where EasyJet reported a significant reduction in pre-tax losses, the chief executive, Johan Lurgden, would uh, look to build its holiday business's market share. He said while the airline had tens of millions of passengers every year, uh, only a fraction were booking additional holiday services such as hotels with the airline. Gary Wilson's TUI uh, managing director group uh, of group product and purchasing will join EasyJet Holidays later this year as its chief executive. He will report to uh, Lung, uh, Lung, 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 I said earlier, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Johan, uh, also formerly of Tui. An EasyJet spokesperson said that EasyJet is in favour of protection for customers and those booking package holidays with EasyJet holidays are already fully protected through the Atoll scheme. We're now fully compliant with the new regulations. Now, uh, that is a positive story however um <laughs> easyjet also uh, this is from the aol.co.uk signals that summer travel misery uh, after nearly 1300 flights cancelled in june alone oh blimey That's um, so 
they might need protection, the EasyJet uh, customers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, EasyJet has added to fears over a summer tra- of travel chaos as it revealed at nearly 1,300 were cancelled a- uh, in the last month with no I- end in sight to air traffic control strike action. So this is all about the uh, strike action in uh, the French and the Italian strikes. It said it cancelled exactly 1,263 flights in June and... Uh, Around 900 due to French and Ita- uh, Italian strikes and a further 150 caused by air traffic control uh, restrictions and poor weather. Huh? Hmm. That doesn't make up to 1,200. Anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hey, we'll have a little bit of maths to do. Uh, <laughs> this marks uh, a steep increase on the 9,700... Oh, sorry. The 974... Uh, EasyJet flights cancelled in May and compares to with, uh, compares to just 213 a year earlier. Figures come uh, just a day after Ryanair said ATC strike action on the continent left more than 210,000 of its passengers hit by uh, flight cancellations in June. And that would be what uh, about the same number of flights, I guess. Yeah, about the same number of flights, yeah, just over a 1,000 flights. Um, the Dublin-based carrier said uh, more than 1,100 flights were cancelled for the second month running due to air traffic control strikes over the four weekends in June. It lays uh, bare the travel woes faced by passengers heading into the key summer holiday travel season as industrial action continues to wreak havoc. Yeah, um, basically it just goes on uh, to say a little bit more about... Um, what you are doing about it and pretty much nothing uh <laughs> lots of uh lots of airline groups including Ryanair IAG uh are trying to make a complaint to the uh European commissioner our European commission uh basically saying that EU law uh is not really protecting flights over France as as it's supposed to uh, while they're they're striking the air traffic control is striking there um, and that it needs to be kind of more uh, more closely protected more closely uh, monitored and it's just a bit of a headache really so I mean Al what I mean what I mean this may not be a, a question that you can answer but what is the the benefit about sort of operating your own atoll registration as opposed to having a third party in involved it's a very good question and I have been trying to work out why EasyJet are doing this mm. and on face value I have no idea at all okay Um, Historically, in the past, in the UK, um, and I'm going to prefix this with, I do not think this is the reason, Okay. but with regards to EasyJet, but historically in the past in the UK, airlines that have issued atoll certificates for their flights (coughs) have been required to do so by the CAA on the basis of their financial stability. Okay. So, for example, Monarch Airlines had to do this for a period of time, and they're not the only airline that has had to, whereby the CAA step in and say, okay, we have concerns about your financial stability, so you now need to issue uh, atoll uh, atoll certificates to each and every one of your passengers. So, in simple terms, when a passenger buys a ticket... £2.50 goes to the CAA uh, into basically an insurance fund right. such that any person buying a ticket from an atoll bonded airline, and I think I'm right in saying that EasyJet will probably be the only one in the UK at the moment, their flight is guaranteed by virtue of this um, CAA bond. Right. Um, so if the, it, and like I say, I'm prefix this with this, is yeah. I don't think the reason why EasyJet is no. doing this, but if the airline was to fail, then that money is used to provide rescue flights, as in yeah. the case of what happened with Monarch. Now, I can't think as to a reason as to why an airline would voluntarily go down this route. They're saying that it's legislation, but I don't know why, because other airlines aren't doing it. Um, so it does put you at a financial disadvantage because if you're just buying a ticket uh, as a simple flight only, mm. um, then you know 
with EasyJet being at or bonded, uh, it's the best ticket you can have. It's gold plated. You will, yeah, you, you know, will get be home. flown even if you know yeah. things happen. But it costs the airline two pound fifty to administer that ticket if they're at or bonded or there and thereabouts. Yeah. So I honestly do not know the answer as to why they're doing this. And uh, reading the the TTG article, they don't seem to know either. Right. Um, and this is quite a an established, well-known, uh, very knowledgeable trade publication. So um, I wonder what EasyJet um, have up their sleeve. Um, and I can only assume that it's going to be something good. I mean, their their finances are stable, so it's nothing uh, untoward in that sense. But honest answer, I really don't know. No. Mm. No, it's it's good, some good, uh, some interesting points there, Ali. It's it, it's it's a sort of it's a not quite sure why are we really, uh, but uh, there we are. I'm sure there you know uh, it will become clear in in time, I guess. But uh, there we go. Anyway, so the, next, the next story is uh, is ours as well. It's all about uh, the good old turboprop. Uh, yep, I I do have that story here. I was looking through some other stuff, so. Um, just talk amongst yourselves whilst I, I find <laughs> that one. Here we go. Right. It's, uh, it's from Bloomberg. And uh, the, uh, the title is The Airline Propeller Era is Coming to an End. A chapter of US air travel came to a quiet end on July 4th when the final turboprop for American Airlines Group Incorporated landed into Maryland's eastern shore at dusk. Oh, it's quite a romantic setting they're setting here in this article. <laughs> I wonder if everyone was holding hands at the end. Oh, I dare say. Uh, American regional carrier Piedmont Airlines was the final operator of turboprops amongst the big three, yes, three U.S. carriers and their affiliates. An era that stretched back to their first flights by Delta Airlines Incorporated and United in 1928. Uh, that must be when Captain Jeff started flying. <gasps> Okay. <laughs> American's <laughs> initial commercial service in uh, June 1936 used a Douglas DC-3. United ended its, its prop flying on May 31st with their last service in Guam. Uh, Piedmont flight uh, 4927 or 4927, as the Americans would prefer, a Bombardier-8-300 arrived in from Salisbury, Maryland, at 8.35 p.m. local time, uh, Wednesday, sorry, so that was on 8.35 local time on Wednesday from American's Charlotte, North Carolina hub. The Dash 8 first flew for Piedmont in May 1985. Piedmont also created a documentary film to celebrate the Dash 8's retirement. The retirement of American's prop planes followed similar decisions at Delta, and United Continental Holdings Incorporated, which have replaced them with a mix of uh, Bombardier and Embraer SA regional jets. American replaced the Salisbury flights with Embraer. Airlines company briefly flew back Boeing 717s and 727s, but never turboprops. What that's got to do with the price of fish, I don't know. <laughs> of course, the turboprop is hardly gone from U.S. skies. Horizon Air, a subsidiary of Alaska Air Group, Inc., still flies the Bombardier Q400, and Empire Airlines, Inc., flies the ATR 42-500 in Hawaii for Hawaiian Holdings, Inc. The collective turboprop retirement was reported earlier by the Cranky Flyer blog. I, I beg your pardon. <laughs> Well, that's fantastic. That is. I didn't um, realise well, you'd. Yes, I didn't realise you'd started a blog, Al. That's great news. <laughs> <laughs> Good old Bloomberg. Yeah, fantastic piece of uh, journalism there. Right. Uh, a, a, a story interspersed with trivia, nonsense, and absolute rubbish. Right. But anyway, um, so there you go. Um, uh, the, the Dash Eight is uh, no longer flying for um, American Airlines. There right. we go. That's, okay. Uh, 
that's that's, that's they uh, padded that that out a lot, didn't they? Really. And what about this, <laughs> yes. uh, Al? I mean, obviously, turboprops are traditionally very expensive to operate for the airlines. Um, what about the sort of the new generation of sort of seventy to one hundred seat uh, small jets? Uh, do you think they are as inexpensive to operate as the uh, the previous turboprop era? Well, it's an interesting one actually because you have to look at uh, reliability and uh, uh, dispatch reliability as well because historically turboprops haven't been very reliable. They've been cheap to lease, uh, cheap to operate with regards to fuel. I mean, they sort of, you know, burn a thimble full of fuel for a half hour flight. Um, but uh, as anybody will know, uh, they're invariably broken. So um, I suspect that going forward, uh, the airlines will be looking at things like the C-Series um, and going, okay, well, hopefully we can get the same sort of uh, fuel economy um, from these modern engines and wingleted, shockleted, uh, whatever litted you wanted to put on your wings. Um, so, yeah, I think undoubtedly uh, now that uh, technology is advanced on the regional jets, um, I think that they will see the same economy, well, hopefully a better dispatch reliability. Yes, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Really, the uh, mm. the absolute reliability of the aircraft to uh, to get off the gate and get to its destination. So uh, yeah, uh, right. Well, moving on then on to the uh, Express.co.uk, another excellent aviation um, <laughs> tome. Yes, and it's a British Airways story. Oh, and it says how much hand luggage can be taken on board a flight for free. Well, I can get away with a lot, but that's not a story. <laughs> that's, that's because you're so nev, though, you see. That's, well, that's you know. Is, yeah. But not everybody hands out £20 notes at the gate, do they? No, no. no. That's, that's where I'm going, <laughs> yep. So the BA passengers heading abroad this year should check with the airline how much luggage they can take with them, as it can vary depending on the destination. Or BA... do as Nev does, or just slip a £20 note into his passport as he you know, just hands in his body. Rock up. And, Highly uh, controversial. Little, uh, little wink of the eye and yeah. little <laughs> shimmy and off he goes. We, 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 with we, we, yeah. Yeah. Danger, yeah, Danger Will I, Robinson. I lost, abort. I lost abort. my driving licence, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, wow. Well, BA flights could soon tackle the budget airline, in, uh, airline market is uh, IAG introduced their new routes from Vienna with low-cost airline level. Low-cost airlines offer no frills tickets to keep costs low, meaning that they often remove additional extras such as meals and hand luggage. Ryanair and Wizz Air are two airlines who have recently introduced new cabin baggage rules. Uh, there are now charges when booking tickets. But what can BA passengers take into the cabin with them for free? The hand luggage and checked-in bag limit uh, ch charge, sorry, can change depending on the location and the ticket fare. Uh, BA passengers can take both a cabin bag and a smaller handbag with them on board. The handbag or laptop bag must be no heavier than 23 kilos and measure less than 40 centimetres by 30 centimetres by 15 centimetres. This is slightly different for, for passengers travelling to or from Brazil. While well, a bag uh, slightly bigger of 45 by 36 by 20, but weighing the same. Hold luggage must also be no more than 23 kilos, but can be up to 56 by 45 by 25 centimetres in length. The size must include all handles and wheels, and the airline also advises that it may need to be checked in if it's a busy flight. Um, but passengers flying from Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon and Saudi Arabia are not allowed to take any laptops or tablets into the cabin. Mobile phones larger than 16 centimetres by 9.3 by 1.5 must also be checked in. And bags must measure no more than 90 centimetres by 75 by 43. But the weight and cost differs depending on the ticket bought. Basic fares are hand luggage only, so passengers would need to purchase a bag to check in. From London Gatwick and London City, it costs £20, whilst it costs £25 from London Heathrow. And all uh, air, other airport charge, uh, 30, uh, all other airports charge £30 for the one checked in bag. All additional bags cost £60 per bag. Other tickets allow at least one bag to be checked in, ranging from 23 kilos to 32 kilos, depending on the ticket. And passengers are also warned by the airline to check if a connecting flight 
is a different carrier. If they are, then the luggage rules may differ and travellers are advised to check beforehand to avoid being stung by additional fees at the airport. EasyJet passengers have different hand luggage rules to abide by. Whilst every passenger is allowed to take a bag on board with no weight limit, basic tickets are not permitted to have a second smaller bag or laptop bag. Luckily, that's all very straightforward and there was no ambiguity or difficulty understanding. <laughs> no, no, a very straightforward that, story, really. absolutely, perfectly. What a well, I, they were flying from Brazil to Vienna. How, how, what size bag can I take? No, don't. <laughs> I, I'm not even taking it all in, you know. And <laughs> but that trying, actually is quite trying to work small. all this out, especially if you're changing carrier, you know, on the second sector of your journey or something like that. It is absolute madness, all of this. Yeah. Um, and I, don't, I just don't see it getting any better at all, do you? Well, the, the concept of these either 23 kilo or unlimited weight handbags just being, you know, brought on the aircraft, uh, just was belief, really. I mean, uh, Owen will know that the problem that handbags create. And, you, you know, 23 kilos, I mean, your average person is going to struggle to carry that up the air bridge. Um, well, I mean, I, I know, I know from personal experience that Owen is never seen without his handbag. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. Uh, so, yes. I mean, so, uh, my, ca I mean, my cabin crew bag would be it, it might be twenty three kilos, but it's definitely larger than uh, forty by thirty by fifteen. That's quite a small. That is a very very small. That's a, that's like a, a business sort of, sort of overnight satchel. case. <laughs> uh, it's not really a. Hmm. Maybe it is just for business travellers. Maybe we have uh, have mm. stopped taking economy passengers well, I mean, altogether. Did, did, did this handbag that's uh, no heavier than twenty three kilos. I mean, that's just th ridiculous. That's, that's absolutely right into the hands of coin collectors and lead carriers. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, yeah. Is, there I mean, is. If there's a convention of you know coin collectors, they I mean they're, they're going to be coining it in. You know, <laughs> they're, they're, it's it's free for them. I'm I'm sure I mean, that we didn't where have. Where are the I'd say I'd, I'm sure we didn't have that much hand, um, like suitcase weight when we when we went through um, when when we went to New York with uh, American not American who did I fly with I've forgotten now United uh, I'm sure I'm sure we weren't allowed to you know I think we were right on the limit of I mean that's a, a very heavy bag uh, twenty three kilos is a bag of cement I mean most <laughs> people would but struggle to, to, you know, lift it any significant amount. So how the hell is it going to go in the hat bin? <laughs> and how is it going to be safe if you have, like, if you can, if, let's say just for devil, you know, devil's advocate <gasps> here, um, you manage to get three bags that are uh, 40 by 30 by 15, all into the hat bin and all at 23 kilos. I don't think that the hat bins are uh, stress tested for that amount of weight. <laughs> well, as you will know, you know, um, you know the, the, the hat bins do have a maximum permitted weight yeah, in them. Yeah, they definitely you know, do. It, it's yeah. placarded. And uh, you won't get many 23 kilo laptops in there, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> if, they, if they're carrying around 20 kilo laptops, I think it's about time they updated them. I think that's, you know, I mean, that sounds like, you well, know, we, we, do you remember the, the old ones with the floppy <laughs> disk drive and the orange screens? You know, I mean, the, those were probably 20 kilos a, a throw. Oh, I wouldn't recommend throwing them. I mean, you would kill people with them, but uh, yeah, it's. Well, no, uh, that, that that also poses another issue. Um, if if for some, for example, someone opens them up and something has been placed in there correctly, yeah. they fall down. <laughs> Twenty three kilos is a lot. I've i because when we went to Rome, I had somebody open the the the, the well, hat bin above me. Not Twenty three kilos. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, yeah, yeah. and it's not as big, certainly. I, yeah. I, I'm just going to think. Actually, can I take a sledgehammer on board? No, it doesn't quite fit the, the dimensions, <laughs> does it? Yeah, so, no, not big enough. Yeah, indeed. You'd but, probably I mean, take I, a, I like a, a mason's mallet or something. <laughs> I had a rucksack fall out of the hat bin and clonk me on the head when we went to Rome. Yeah, you know. Yeah. I mean, uh, and that's quite sore. And uh, that might only be five kilos, and uh, yeah, yeah twenty three is just. Uh, <laughs> This I mean, definitely comes into the category of they haven't thought it through. Uh, right, right. No. yes. Indeed. They haven't asked one member of cabin crew. I can definitely yeah, yeah, tell you that yeah, much. Absolutely, because they would. Yeah. I, I'm going to write to the British Guild of Coin Collectors and suggest that they have an outing <laughs> just to test this out. Right. Okay, yes. Fair enough. Uh, okay, we're going to move on then, ladies and gentlemen. Well, uh, just before we move on, oh, okay. just before we move on, there's a, there's a side story to this that I think is quite interesting, and it's it's only very loosely mentioned in this article, and it's got nothing to do with bags. And this is uh, IAG's uh, low-cost airline level 
that has uh, started to fly routes out of Vienna. Now, I want to know what is going on in Vienna because Level have started to operate out of uh, Vienna. Ryanair have gone into Vienna. Uh, we've now got Louder Motion operating out of Vienna. And I believe Wizz Air are starting a base in Vienna. So I'm beginning to think that Vienna is going to become a very big player in Europe because mm -hmm. with all of these airlines being enticed there, um, it's going to be uh, interesting to see where they fit into the, the global framework of hub airlines within Europe because uh, it's just growing rapidly, uh, that airport. I think um, Loud Emotion sold some of their slots uh, before they handed over to Ryanair. And I know Ryanair are now operating Loud Emotion's flights there. So the, the Ryanair aircraft that you see are actually... Loud emotion tickets. Really? Okay. Um, so Reiner themselves, while they have a base there, it's not under Ryanair. It's not under Ryanair, as most of the public know Ryanair. It's under so uh, basically, Loud Emotion. Uh, uh, loud Emotion of wet leased Ryanair aircraft then to operate for them. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, but they're kind of wet leasing them from themselves because. Um, Ryanair have bought... Well, they've wet themselves. Okay, well, that's... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ryanair have bought uh, Loud Emotion, um, not outright, but I think 75%. Um, okay. Wow. Yeah, so they're wet leasing them from themselves, basically. Okay, that seems yeah. that seems slightly from, bonkers. I'm well, not well, <laughs> well, who knows what sort of tax evasion? Well, <laughs> well, do, who knows? Let's, let's let's let, let's not uh, st start on that uh, subject for too long. The um, actually, while we're talking about uh, baggage or suitcases uh, and things like that, uh, we, we've had uh, uh, some picture. Uh, messages sent to me uh, from Jonathan Warner actually. Now I don't know which airport this was or where he's been recently um, but I think it's safe to say that this uh, hard shelled suitcase has had a very very rough flight um, <laughs> I've never seen anything. That's my case! Right, it's <laughs> it, okay fair enough. So yeah, this this has been sent in by Jonathan Warner. I mean honestly I've never seen a suitcase so bad. I mean what on earth must have happened to that suitcase for it to end up like that? <laughs> I just like, you know I, I, we're Swiss, I, I don't know, was it Swiss port on duty or um I don't it know. It looks like a, a dog was hungry or something. Uh, yes, had a, it had a good a kind of, lump out of it, isn't it? Yeah, yes. indeed. Yeah, so I, yeah, I, I'd be amazed if the stuff inside is also unharmed, but uh, there we are. I've come up with a way that you can effectively use this 23 kilos um, limit. Any liquids that you want to bring with you, you freeze them all and you bring it with you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. They can't really get you for it because it's a solid once it freezes over. I don't want to know about your solids. There's no need for that. <laughs> Family show. Uh, Honestly. Anyway, where are we? Who's next? That, that was me rescuing uh, <laughs> some beer from the freezer. Yes, indeed. Yes, I put some freezer, a beer in the freezer to chill it out, and then our studio guest very kindly brought us beer, and uh, I forgot about it. So, uh, yes, it was all a bit frozen in the uh, thing. Anyway, we're going to move on to the next story. This is on the BBC News website, and the headline is Boeing strikes aircraft deal with Brazil's Embraer, which is quite exciting. Uh, Boeing has agreed a deal that will give it control of Embraer's uh, commercial jet business. Part of me feels this is a sad story, I think, actually. I think this is a bit of a shame, but uh, the proposed joint venture will give the US aerospace giant a significant stake in the market for smaller passenger planes. Boeing has been um, where are we? Sorry, Boeing has been courting Brazil's Embraer for some time. The need for a deal has recently become more pressing since its European rival Airbus took control of Bombardier's C Series regional jet program. Its deal with the Canadian company had threatened to give Airbus a significant advantage in the global marketplace. Uh, the agreement, which values Embraer's air commercial aircraft operations at $4.75 billion, will restore partially. Uh, will restore store uh, parity between Boeing and Airbus. Under the proposed deal, Embraer's commercial business will be placed in a new joint venture with, Boeing's holding, uh, with Boeing holding 80% stakes worth of $3.8 billion. Uh, that's £2.9 billion pounds in sterling. Embraer is a Brazilian industrial champion and uh, a major manufacturer of military systems. News of the deal uh, sent its shares down more than 10% in Sao, Sao Paulo on Thursday. Some investors had hoped Embraer's share of the joint venture would be higher than 20%. 
So, uh, Dennis Mullings, who is the uh, Muhlenberg, sorry, uh, who is the Boeing chief executive, said by forging this strategic partnership, we will ideally be ideally positioned to generate uh, significant value for both companies, customers, employees, and shareholders, and for Brazil and the U.S. Boeing said that the deal is expected to close by the end of 2019, pending the necessary approvals. It's a bit of a shame, really. I, I don't know. I I, under, I I understand why, but. You know, I, I, I just, I, I, I just don't like the idea of there only being two people, like, you know, making airplanes. Yeah, I wonder will this uh, drive prices of airline tickets up for consumers? Because uh, obviously you have less and less and less uh, manufacturers. You're going to have less competition, um, and possibly driving prices and uh, leading to increased fares. I don't know. Just a just a thought, just a, a wondering. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Mm. I think we'll all be flying around in Chinese airliners in about ten or fifteen years' <laughs> yeah. time, anyway. Might yeah. not be a bad thing. Well, I mean, as long as they fly, I suppose that's the main thing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, as long as they've got their appropriate certificates. Um, well, if you think about it, when um, when Embraer decided to launch their first uh, jet, which was the 145, um, you know, a lot of people are going, ha, well, that, that won't succeed, will it? You know, Brazilian? Yeah, no, no. Uh, you know, despite the fact that Embraer had sold many, many uh, turboprop aircraft in the United States, uh, you know, uh, Brazilia and so forth, uh, and yet, the 145 turned out to be a huge success for Embraer, and that led on to, uh, you know, the 175, the 195, um, and that became a, a global player in the aircraft market. So there's no reason why uh, another country can't come into the to the competition and uh, shake up the marketplace again. But I do agree with you, Matt. It's um, it's slightly worrying that there's only two key players, you know, yeah. currently left, and. Uh, with them hell bent on buying up the competition, that's not good for the consumer overall. No, it can't be, can it? I mean, it's difficult to, you know, it's they can basically. I mean, I might be controversial by saying this, but they can sort of almost set their own prices, can't they? Between the, between the pair of them, and uh, yeah, as you say, I don't think that's healthy for any uh, consumer market. Well, no, it's like living in a town where there's only a Chinese takeaway and an Indian takeaway. You kind of stuffed, aren't you? Because <laughs> none of them are going to be particularly good. They don't have to strive that hard to to do top food so you kind of lump it or like it don't you yeah yeah mm. indeed yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> sorry no. i wasn't describing bungie no 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 right okay <laughs> I, I thought you exactly were describing <laughs> how very rude well uh, excuse me i'll have you, you know we have a fine array of excellent outlets here in bungie uh chans doesn't need competition she is awesome Anyway. As long as you don't want to draw any money out of the bank. Uh, yeah, there is an issue in the fact that we don't literally have... I mean, in fact, actually, we made news. We made actual, in, like, national mm. news uh, because Bungie literally has one cash machine and it usually... They fill it up sort of like at 8am and it's empty by 9.30. Uh, mm. <laughs> but okay. uh, there, yeah, there we are. Anyway, sorry, that's that's got nothing to do with aviation. Uh, uh, who's next? That would be you, that's I think, Owen, isn't it? Oh, yes. yes. Uh, this yeah. is a friendly story in that... Matt likes to do lots of pictures, doesn't he? Oh, does he? Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not when he's on his third card of cider, he doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, no. there we are. Uh, and there's video and everything as well. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Uh, so this is from the Arabian Briz- business.com and it says Emirates Airline uh, completes reconfiguration of second Boeing 777-200 uh, LR. The Emirates $150 million reconfiguration plan sees first class removed from each Boeing uh, 777-200LR aircraft and a new wider business class seats in a 222 format installed. Emirates Engineering has completed a second reconfiguration of 10 of the aircraft in uh, that Emirates have in its fleet. The $150 million reconfiguration plan sees first class removed from each uh, Boeing 777 <laughs> and a new wider business class uh, format installed. The aircraft's economy class are also fully refreshed in what is a complete overhaul of the interior. Emirates Engineering completed most uh, the most recent conversion of the aircraft from the 3-2 to two, uh, class configuration in its hangars in Dubai. 
The first uh, Emirates Boeing uh, 777-200LR was completed earlier this year and took to the skies in March 2018. The remaining eight are uh, in Everett's fleet will be reconfigured by mid-2019 and deployed to a number of other cities on the airline's global network, including to Santiago, Chile, Emirates' latest destination in South America, which I believe they um, launched a few days ago. Uh, Emirates Engineering undertook a detailed and complex pr- uh, process to ensure that the job was completed successfully and on time, taking 22 months to execute the first reconfiguration, starting from the time the decision was made to when it rolled out of the hangar ready for its first commercial flight. In total, the team had to work with over 30 suppliers and had to manage more than 2,700 parts and spares at any one point of time. And there's some some amazing, amazing pictures of uh, the new cabins looking really, really refreshed, um, looking super spacious. There's uh, plenty of pictures there, a video of um, them actually installing the 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 new uh, the new configuration as well, which is what quite cool. What do we cool. think about them removing first class? That's quite a statement, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, well, it shows that they just haven't ha- had the uh, uptake that they were expecting across this particular uh, aircraft or the routes that it flies on uh, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah it's it's it I suppose it's a, a they're the first um, they're the first of the aircraft uh, to be kind of taken uh, taking first class off and I suppose that's uh, only going to kind of continue on mm. uh, as it goes on because uh, I think you, what you, I've done, yeah. Sorry, go on. Go yeah, on. Uh, just okay. Do Do you think you'll see other carriers essentially doing the same thing? So, so actually yeah, I, th- I think you will. Away with... I think you will. And the the reason is because business has become so uh, similar to first mm. class, and really, there's a very very little difference in the product. Well, I mean, that's just me looking at it from a objective point of view. I are from a. a... Yeah, do you do much first class flying? <laughs> no, <don't> <laughs> Especially at Harp Jet, very comfortable, I'm sure. Yeah, plenty of first class there. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, I actually wonder whether this is the um, the effects of uh, the ability now for the ultra rich to be able to uh, have their own aircraft or buy into fractional True. ownership. Yeah. Uh, and to be able to just hop onto a biz jet from their local airport, go to where they need to go when they want to go. Uh, I mean, it's a very positive spin by Emirates, and undoubtedly their business class product is excellent. But I can't help but feel that it's a positive spin on a downgrade because yeah, yeah. historically the Middle Eastern carriers have traded mm. on this absolutely palatial first class product um, that is now being removed. Yeah, it's um, it's it's a funny one, isn't it? I, I I I mean, this is maybe this is a question we can ask Pip. I mean, is it? Well, you guys might know the answer to the, this. I mean, it, if you're paying for a first class seat, I mean, how does that differ to renting your own? To, to say d- like hiring, uh, you know, a company like SafeJet to and 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 to have Pip like take you from where you want to go to where you want to end up do you know what i mean i mean well i think that kind of depends on frequency no uh if you're if you're someone who needs to be traveling uh at a moment's notice uh if you're someone who needs to be traveling um first class then definitely it's it's uh the the airline industry is possibly well it, we, it's we, possibly a little restrictive We'd all uh, like to fly first class. I mean, that's not... <laughs> it's, you know, we, we all wouldn't mind a I go mean, of there it. There is a big difference between first class and business class, and it's usually about 10 years on the vintage of the champagne. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And actually, usually speaking, the, the people who are uh, travelling in business class uh the nurlies or the people who think that they're something incredibly special whereas generally the people who are in first class are there because they know that they've already made it and they don't have anything to prove no, and quite no. often the first class passengers are less demanding than the business class passengers because they yeah. know what they want they know what they yeah. don't want um, and there will be some people in first class who will just be quite happy to just sit there 
uh, you know, maybe have a you know a glass of orange juice, carry on with what they need to do, and they're not interested in all of the the glitz and glamour. Yeah. It's usually the people in business class who are trying to um, uh, get everything that they possibly can out of it. Yeah. Um, so I can see why Emirates have taken this this view to uh, expanding the the business class, but uh, for me, it's a downgrade. Um, you know, but if that's the the route that they have to take to uh, continue to be commercially viable, and you know, historically, a lot of the Middle Eastern carriers have thrown money at these projects, um, yeah. well, we shall have to see. Well, they're investing 150 million US dollars in it, so it has to be <laughs> something yeah. that uh, that will work. And uh, I mean, it is only just it is only 10 aircraft out of their. Uh, what three hundred or so strong? They're, doing, yes. they're presumably doing specific routes, aren't they? That's that's probably yeah, why I mean, they've been they've been sort of pulled. I mean, Nev. I mean, what what are your thoughts on on this? I mean, do you see see the same as Al as a, as a bit of a downgrade? Have you have you ever flown first class class over business? No, I never have. have um, you not? But amazed. I just think about that bizjet versus first class yeah. thing. Of course, the advantage about being on a biz jet is that you can go where you want to go. And mm. typically, the, the biz jets, I mean, they do sometimes, but they don't always use the bigger airports. So they, often it's more convenient for city center travel, for example, yeah. and, that, and that kind of thing. So I think that there's always going to be a big market for that. The first class um, thing, uh, the, the prices are just so expensive. I'm looking at some of the BA first fares as I was the other day just for a laugh because I do that from time to time you know how much would it cost me to go to New York first class on BA you know if I wanted to book it you know in three weeks time and it is mortgage? eye-watering you know it's 7,800 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we're, uh, we're, 7, we're, we're, gonna say, we're certainly in uh, nosebleed territory I yeah, think can't yes. we <laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely. well I mean yeah. th th there's no doubt that um, traveling first class is very very nice um, um, when my wife and I went some years ago uh, the cabin crew uh, realized that uh, it was our honeymoon so when we were getting off the aircraft they equipped us with 10 bottles of champagne to take oh, off like, we're carrying Hello. bags of champagne <laughs> so um, quite clearly there's there's a, an amount of uh, uh, budgetary spend that's available for looking after you <laughs> okay, <laughs> fair enough. yes um, yes and actually from time to time it is uh, it is possible to travel uh, on BA and uh, other good carriers uh, first class without having to go and rob a bank. Right. Um, okay. <laughs> but um, quite often, if you want to go somewhere nice, then it does uh, cost a, a king's ransom. But it is worth yeah. it. Now, if yeah. you don't want to pay a king's ransom uh, on the uh, on the flight, you can immerse yourself in the uh, 3D cabin technology which Emirates have. And this is, basically is an immersive 3D, 360 uh, view of the interior of both their A380 and their uh, 777 and this is Emirates again uh, and you can see uh, exactly what the uh, first class the business class and indeed the economy class uh, looks like now I should just say before Owen starts reading this I do have a video that I'm going to play uh, however I have obviously had to render it down into boring old 2D in order to be able to sort of <gasps> give you a demonstration because I'm afraid the P PTUK broadcast tower doesn't have the uh, power uh, to be able to handle a 3D video Yet. so uh, you know no glasses required for the forthcoming uh, <laughs> Like, off, off you go. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry, I think you're gonna. I think you're gonna play. You're gonna play it when I talk. Uh, yeah. So it's it's become Emirates have become the first airline to introduce web virtual reality technology on its different uh, digital platforms. Uh, the 3D seat model is a visualiz visualization engine that displays an immersive 3D 360 degree interior of the Emirates A380 and the 777. Oh, excuse me. Uh, giving customers a chance to explore the aircraft interior and seating. This 3D uh, seat map VR feature allows users to navigate through the economy, business and first class, as well as the onboard lounge and shower spa in the Emirates A380 using navigational hotspots. In our usability tests with customers, we found that they particularly appreciated the 3D seat and cap models when selecting their seats, said Alex uh, Nee, I think it is. Uh, Emirates Senior Vice President for Corporate Communications, Digital Marketing and Brand. Boy, that's a title. Uh, 
the high quality it rolls 3- off the tongue, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it does, doesn't it? The high quality 3D generated graphics are now available for the three classes, but will soon include renderings of Emirates' entire fleet, including all configurations of the A380 and Boeing 777 aircraft, the carrier said. Uh, they feature a virtual reality for a more immersive experience and users can ev- enjoy a hands-free cabin navigation and seek selection using any VR headset such as Google Cardboard. Uh, this technology is compatible with all devices without the need for external applications or plugins. And the seat, uh, 3D seat model uh, models were created in partnership with a Spanish company called uh, Renaissance, which specializes in cutting-edge software development. You can check it out on Emirates.com or via their mobile uh, devices or on the Emirates app for iOS and Android. Um, before you check in, <laughs> that's right. Neil Lamwell's put in the chat room has made me, made me laugh here. He's put, I it's just a gaze upon the luxury ple- peasants. I quite like that. <laughs> that's the way forward. Uh, <laughs> yeah, again, it, it reminds me a bit of that uh, TV program that, uh, uh, what was it, Bullseye. You know, oh the, yes, yes. Let's like, have a look yeah, at what you could have won. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And why is it that they always used to give a speedboat to somebody who lived in a high-rise flat in Birmingham? I never really understood <laughs> why why that was a thing. Uh, but anyway, there we are. In one. Very good. Yes. <laughs> yes. No top ten this week, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> oh no. But we do have another um, comfort. Um, article um, on right. the sun is, uh, uh, do you think carlos was trying to depress us perhaps with these choices well, i think so but uh, al's going to tell us all about the the luxury that you can experience on the uh, the air lingus oh. absolutely this comes from the uh, the sun website a, a quality publication of course in the united yes. kingdom absolutely uh, the headline is seat defeat air lingus passenger sits on the worst airline seat ever for seven hours with no cushion just Whoa. exposed metal Matt Medragel was on a seven-hour flight from Chicago to Dublin and was set, sat in what can only be described as a shell of a plane seat. If you think you've been stuck in an uncomfortable airline seat before, brace yourself. You haven't seen anything yet. A passenger has dished on his horror flight experience, including a jaw-dropping photo showing the appalling state of his signed seat on the Aer Lingus plane. It makes standard economy seats look like luxury. <laughs> Matt Medragle told consumer advocate site Elliot.org that he was given just a dirty shell of a seat minus any cushioning. As a bonus, he received exposed metal. Oh, and he was stuck in the seat for seven hours as he flew home from Chicago to Dublin. His mother, who first got in touch with the site about the incident, said it was horrifying. Janet Medragle said... The entire flight to Ireland, Aer Lingus, made my son sit in the worst airline seat I've ever seen. She continued, he sent me a picture of his seat. I had to ask him what the picture was. It didn't even look like an airline seat. Elliot.org writer Michelle Couch Friedman agreed with this assessment, writing of a shock at viewing the photo of the ridiculous seat. She said... I struggle to figure out how Aer Lingus could have allowed one of its passengers to endure this uncomfortable monstrosity posing as an airline seat. So how did he get stuck with such a bad seat? And why didn't the crew move him to a more appropriate location? Matt, who sat in the seat, revealed the flight was the flight was two days previous to St. Patrick's Day, so naturally the plane was full of intoxicated patrons. I asked the flight attendant what was going on with my seat when we boarded. She asked me to sit in it until everyone was aboard and settled. Soon after everyone was on, I asked the flight attendant again, and she told me she would get back to me. She never did. Once we took off, I could see I had no other option but to sit in that seat. There were no empty seats. Because the intoxicated patrons were extremely loud and disrespectful, the flight attendants were flustered. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. So he took one for the team. Well, one of the flight attendants, good lad. <laughs> oh dear. Despite, despite having paid 499 for his round trip, Matt was originally offered just £37 as a voucher from the airline as compensation, along with an apology. I'm, yeah, literally, I'm literally apology. sitting here waiting for the reaction from the chat room on that one. 
Take your one for the team. What there it I goes. Say? Yeah, there they go. <laughs> That's what she said. Yeah. <laughs> well, the Aer Lingus apology reads, please accept my sincere apology for Aer Lingus not having met your expectations. I am very sorry for the inconvenience and disappointment resulting from the damage on your damage seat on your flight. Our maintenance crews regularly inspect aircraft to ensure onboard items such as seats, meal trays, entertainment systems, etc. are in working order. <laughs> While ground time may limit their ability to inspect every item, guests experiencing difficulties in flight on previous sectors would inform the cabin crew who in turn would report such items to maintenance teams and a repair would be made prior to departure. A copy of your comments will be forwarded to our head office in Dublin for their review and internal handling. While we cannot accede to your request for compensation, an e-voucher in the amount of £37 will be sent out under separate cover. It was a cover that he wanted for the seat. You could have sent him one of those <laughs> as a yeah. gesture of goodwill. Uh, well, I have to say that... Um, um, if this chap ended up sitting on what is basically the seat mm. pan with no cushion, um, then, well, I mean, taking one for the team, well, yeah, fair enough. But I, I'd have uh, been fairly vociferous in my complaints at the time because <laughs> um, that, that's not on, really. No, it's not. Actually, Je Jen Niffer, she's saying in the chat room here, she's, she's actually asking, how would the seat belts work? Can they be tightened properly without the cushions? I mean, yes, well, it they depends can. how fat Matt is. No, but, yeah, I, I mean, it doesn't make. Uh, <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> now, now look here, it's all got a bit personal. <laughs> this Indeed. is Matt Madragal. Yeah, right. Um, okay. Uh, but yeah, no, the seat belts would, would, would work fine. Okay. Um, you know, the, the the seat cushion actually isn't that big. In fact, but, actually, uh, if he's if if I he's mean, my sort of size, it'd be rather handy because if <laughs> you'll have a little bit more seat belt than you would have normally. <laughs> I also be a bit cross that they, uh, judging by the as usual, the, the picture. Are, are brilliant aren't they yes they've clearly tried to fly an airbus a320 to chicago uh, and that's right. going to get you about three quarters of the way there aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> the fuel ta full tank of fuel yes. and a uh, uh, full load of passengers but they do make it up later on by showing a picture of the a330 right. so that's yeah. okay, yes. okay i mean it. let's be honest yeah. um, uh, i mean i've flown recently with Aer Lingus on the a330 and I found it to be a very pleasant experience. It was a relatively new aeroplane and the seats were comfortable. There was plenty of uh, leg room and the in-flight entertainment worked. So what's happened here? Well, obviously, the, the seat cushion has either been stolen or soiled on the previous sector. And uh, there's been a, a mess up and it's not been replaced or someone has not noticed that there's a, a missing seat cushion. Um, find that hard to believe. Yeah. But... The way that it's been handled it is pretty poor, really. Uh, and uh, uh, shame on Aer Lingus because, you know, 37 euros or pounds, I forget what the article said now, uh, that's not on, you know. Uh, for give, a seven-hour flight, a, yeah. You know, yeah. give this chap a decent amount of money. I mean, he, he's going to have hemorrhoids for life. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> there's, a, there's a thought. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, right. Well, I'm... it did say at the end now that uh, after being contacted by Elliot.org, they're, they're a website that uh, advocate for consumers, uh, that the airline reconsidered their compensation offering instead giving uh, Mr. Madragal a £397 voucher. So they did well eventually uh, reconsider, but... Mm. That was only after it was in the Sun newspaper, presumably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Well, let's move on uh, quickly. Uh, this is on the uh, bizjournals.com website, and it's about Boeing, who passed uh, number 700 on its 787 Dreamliner program. And uh, they have, according to, to uh, the delivery tracking, uh, by investment banker, and they noted that the 787... space is around the world for all of these... 787s that don't fly. Quite. I was going to come to that uh, shortly. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, but I, I, no, I, I, I spoiled I'm, it for you. I'm now. glad okay. that you were uh, preempted that. Um, and uh, noted that 787 follower Yuresh Sheth, that's a very difficult word uh, name to say, who runs all things 787 blog. Uh, number 700 appears to have been delivered to China Southern Airlines last week, and Boeing had reached a total of 900, sorry, 704 Dreamliner deliveries by Friday. 
while the milestone delivery came with no fanfare from the company, it did, like all other 787 deliveries, come with plenty of help from Wichita. Spirit Aerosystems, the city's largest employer, builds the complete composite forward fuselage section uh, and uh, other components on the 787 for Boeing. That is work that will soon be increasing as Boeing has previously announced plans to raise the production rate on the Dreamliner from 12 aircraft per month to 14 per month in 2019. That will in turn speed along the future milestones on the program, which Sheth uh, projecting uh, with Sheth projecting 1,000th delivery to occur around the summer of 2020, depending on when the rate increased is realised during the course of the next year. These people that write these articles never intend them to be read out, do they? Because, uh, <laughs> no. I wonder who's uh, going to be the lucky owner of uh, Airframe 787. Ooh. Good point. Yeah, Ooh, yeah. <laughs> and and w will it be in the air at some point with all the uh, problems that Rolls Royce continue to have with the uh, Trent series that's well, on, that on wings there? Um, that we haven't true. spoken about that for a couple of weeks, so I just wonder how they're getting on with it all. Uh, badly, because <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, if uh, I've been a little bit out of touch, but I think um, the FAA and maybe AASA as well have just put out another. Uh, notice with regards to uh, uh, aircraft and I think quite a few carriers have got a few more grounded so uh, I think it's uh, one step forward two steps backward yeah. <laughs> yes it's going to take him a while to, to break the back of this isn't it definitely it certainly definitely. is uh, I should just say to those of you watching on YouTube uh, this is my friend Alfie by the way this is my little uh, my little Jack Russell who is my best friend in the whole wide world Oh. He is the cutest little thing in the world. And if you're very lucky, like he did when he came into the garden just now, the grin, this dog smiles. I don't know how he does it, uh, but he can actually smile. We can't, we've been trying to get him to do it, uh, but but he won't. So he's just sort of sitting here looking a bit gormless, really, fit like his owner, let's be honest. But uh, <laughs> anyway, sorry, I will... Well, as Alfie's agent, and we haven't actually signed an agreement yet for the fee for the smiling, <laughs> <Right>. so... <laughs> okay, fair enough. All right, yes, I will... More money, more, more uh, dog chews and biscuits are required, presumably, for... Yeah, it was just a simple appearance, <laughs> the smiling's extra. Right, okay? <laughs> okay, fair enough, all right. Sorry, you see, he's, he's, a, he's a tough worker, isn't he, eh? All right, I'm going to put you down on the floor now, so you go, you go, and, uh, you go and see Lisa and Leo. Oh, dear, oh, that was, that was graceful. Anyway... On to the next story. This is on the newshub.co.nz, and the headline is uh, Airline Honours 83-Year-Old Ticket uh, for Man's 90th Birthday. In 1935, 7-Year-Old Arnold Neus uh, won a very special prize. It was a flight around Amsterdam on KLM Dutch Airlines. However... Flown by Jeff. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, he couldn't go on the flight as his sister was sick with a highly infectious disease, scarlet fever. So his prize was put away for 83 years until his granddaughter wrote to the airline's board of directors and asked them if they'd still honour the ticket. So the airline teamed up with his seven-year-old great-grandson uh, Jagger to uh, to give Mr. Nehus a special flight for his 90th birthday. In a video shared to YouTube, Jagger, uh, or Jagger uh, accompanied by two KLM stewardesses, uh, come to pick up Grandpa Noel up for an unforgettable flight, making his dream come true. To his joy, KLM Royal Dutch Airlines still flies propeller planes just as they did when he was just a boy, and he finally got to take to the skies for the flight that he won as a child. Well, that's a lovely end of... Uh, a story to end on, isn't it? Really, that's that. Uh, and some very um, sensible, clever people in the uh, KLM yeah. marketing department there, because uh, it's obviously going to cost them a few quid, but it's got them some good media attention. And uh, there's nothing better than a good story in aviation. And um, uh, maybe British Airways could do with poaching a few of the KLM PR people. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed, yes. Uh, in fact, actually, Lee's just said here in the garden studio here, he said, am I going to sort of, you know, pour bet petrol on the bonfire of what was last week's good story and sort of see if I can ruin this nice feel-good story? But uh, I think we'll we'll walk away from that uh, that uh, particular... I was trying to play the video because there is a video with it, but it won't play for some reason. So uh, there we are. But yes, what a lovely story that is, as you say, and, and, and sensible marketing there, I think, by the... Uh, by the people um, that, that know what... Oh, here we go, there we go. I, don't, I can't get it to play the sound, but uh, there we go. So it's... Uh, 
Uh, can I get it? Oh, never mind. No, I, sh- I should have been more organised, shouldn't I? Uh, right, uh, somebody dig me out of this hole, please, quick. <laughs> well, luckily, that brings us to the end of the commercial news segment. And uh, But uh, up next, um, a couple of weeks ago, or actually more than a month ago now, it was uh, Carlos and I that went over to Bruntingthorpe for the Cold War Jets Day. And one of the things that I've always noticed about the whole thing there is the enthusiasm of the folks that, that look after the aircraft that are there and the people that exhibit it. And uh, when we went there, uh, there was a very nice looking English electric lightning aircraft. And that was uh, a very nice chat that we had with Ian and Steve there. And we're going to play the video now. So we're standing next to a, it's an English electric lightning, I think that's the proper pronunciation for the aircraft. So tell us a bit about this amazing aircraft we're standing next to. Well, the uh, the lightning came into service with the RAF in 1960 um, and stayed in service until 88. Um, We've acquired, this is the lightning preservation group who own these three lightnings we've got here. Um, acquired the first one in or just after they went out of service with the Air Force Um, and Bravo Quebec over there was the um, the second one that they acquired which went to British Aerospace to um, was used as a um, uh, a chase aircraft for part of the tornado project and then when um, British Aerospace had uh, no longer had use for it it flew in here so that was about 1990, I think. So the all three aircraft then in uh, in sort of uh, well airworthy or flight uh, condition? No, th- th- this this one, which is Mark III, <coughs> this is a pure museum piece now. There's no engines in it, um, and it's uh, it, it's just maintained cosmetically. But the other two aircraft, which are both Mark Sixes, um, not quite airworthy, but they're maintained into a close airworthy. <laughs> Airworthy standard. So, what's tell the, uh, the listeners and viewers? Obviously, what's it take to, to keep these aircraft in uh, in the condition they're in? Because obviously, it's it's it, it does money doesn't come for free. Is it? So no, uh, and it, 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 it's a lot. It's a lot of work. It's, quite, it's a very time-consuming aeroplane. Um, in in service, there was something like 400 man hours in maintenance per per flying hour, in that sort of order. Uh, I mean, obviously, as we're, as we're not flying them, the, the maintenance isn't isn't quite so uh, rigorous but we do try and keep them in um, as uh, near to airworthiness condition as possible so any faults that do occur on the aircraft we do try and try and fix um, having said that we're not really concerned with the with the weapon systems or the or the radar some of the electronics we're, because we've we've no call for that but as far as the engines, yeah, fuel systems, hydraulics and general airframe, we do try and keep them as serviceable as possible. So the aircraft... Oh, another taxi run. So what's your role with the aircraft here yourself? Do you, are you sort of uh, engineer or...? Uh... Yeah, both myself and Steve. We're, we're ex-RAF. We used to uh, work on these when, uh, when the RAF were flying them, so we've got... Um, experience back, you know, from back in the day when they're in service. So, um, uh, I, mean, I, I personally, I was, I was engines airframe. Steve was uh, avi- avionics. So, we we sort of uh, try and keep uh, the systems that we we know, uh, you know up and running. Um, and there's, there's there's a there's obviously not just us. There's a group a group of people with um, some are, are XREF and. Uh, fair few in the group actually have mm. never been in the forces but have picked up a lot of knowledge because they've owned the aircraft for 30 years now. Wow. How easy is it to get parts for these aircraft? Obviously these, uh, you know... Yeah. <laughs> um, when they first went out of service they would take all the spare parts they could from the owners. This was strict when it first was put on the Gate Guardian at Lucas and the group went around all places that had lightnings as, and standing there as display aircraft. And we would take all the black boxes out as much as possible we could to use as spares. We've got caravans full of black boxes and full of spares, but when the spares go US, we've got no one to fix them. So that's the problem. It's not the spares, it's getting the spares replaced and fixed to put in the aircraft again. But then, as uh, Ian says, autopilot system, not really bothered. Radar system, not really bothered. Main instrument system, not bothered. We've got a standby system. So all the stuff that we're in, well, I'm interested in the avionics side, not really bothered. 
it's just the uh, hydraulic systems and the engines that are the main things that keep the aircraft going. Yeah, I think, it's like we were saying earlier, I think a lot of people assume that you kind of get donated these aircraft fully functional, working with all the bits and pieces in the right place. Ninety-four flew in from Wharton and it was fully functional. Seven to eight was flown in by a guy called Chris Berners Price. He basically climbed that and said, there you are, the aircraft's yours, and that's it. The group bought it, the Air Force delivered it and said, there you are, that's yours. But the problem came when they said, well, how do we keep it sort of serviced and sort of uh, protected from the elements? Because when it first came here, they were covered in just covers. And then they wrote to Rolls-Royce and said, well, how do we inhibit the engines? You can't inhibit the Rolls-Royce Avon. The best thing is to run it once a month. How do we do that? Find someone who can run the Avon engine. And that's how it started. They then went to find people who had been on these things in the Air Force, engine guys. I can run the engine. Right, can you come down once a month and run the engine for us? And then the, the knowledge spread from there, really. I was say, as, a, as a group, a preservation group, how easy is it to find you know, guys like you who, who are not only passionate but know the ins and outs of the Lightning? There's people coming here all the time. Um, like today, we've, we've met people here we've not seen since 30 years ago in the Air Force. The word gets around. People come down. If they're interested, they'll come take part. As simple as that. One of the questions we always ask uh, before we wrap up our interviews at air shows, we always ask the people we interview, it's a kind of put-you-on-the-spot question. Uh, but for you, Ian, it's, it's, uh, if given a chance to fly any aircraft, albeit military, commercial, GA, retire, retired or still flying, what would that aircraft be you jump into right now, <laughs> given the chance? <coughs> well, I mean, given the chance, it's got to be one of these, really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, I mean that, that's, that's, well, we're not, we're not here because there's no chance of being able to fly one again, but it would, I mean, it, it, it would be nice. Yeah, I was, I was lucky enough to fly um, in them when, when they were in service in the Air Force. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it, I, I think you, if you... Uh, the, the list of aircraft, actually, that pilots want to fly <laughs> is something like this. Spitfire is obviously near the top yeah. of the list. You know, they're, some of the warbirds, but... Yeah, I mean, if I was given the opportunity to fly in one of these, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ask for a second time. I'd go straight away. <laughs> and for you, same question, Steve. I'm too tall. I can't, I've had a chance to fly a two-seat Spitfire. I couldn't fit in. I'm too tall. I could fly the two-seat Lightning, but I could never fly one single seat because I'm too tall. Um, I've flown in the Hawk. That was all right. Flown in Tornado. That's all right. So, really, Typhoon's the next one. But I'm not, I've sat in a Typhoon. I used to work on them at Coningsby. But, uh, yeah, I go Typhoon. So I'm too big for a Spitfire and too big for a Lightning. Oh, well, there we go. Well, thanks, Ian and Steve, for your time today. It's been great to talk to you both about this amazing aircraft. And uh, just as a quick plug for the listeners and viewers who want to find out more information, is there, is there somewhere they can look to find out? Yeah, we, uh, Lightning Preservation Group has a, um, a website. It's uh, lightning.org or lightnings.org. Yeah, uh, and, they, and, and everything we do is sort of detailed on there. Excellent. Well, thanks for your time and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye. Take care. Enjoy. Find this and other great shows at the Aviation Media Network. The Voices in Your Head dot com. The Plain Talking UK podcast is a voluntary project that aims to keep you informed with the latest aviation related stories from news wires across the globe. Producing our content does cost money though. If you enjoy our show, why not help us keep on the air by making a donation towards the server and website hosting fees through PayPal? Any contributions would be greatly appreciated. Are you an Amazon user? If so, why not do your shopping through the link on our website? There's no cost to yourself and Amazon pays us a small referral fee on qualifying purchases. To find out more about the show and to meet the team, take yourself to our website website www.plaintalkinguk.com or find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash plaintalkinguk on Twitter via at plaintalkinguk or get in touch via email on podcast at plaintalkinguk.com Thanks, Thanks for, for listening. listening. Flyby 5823 Trent Dane for 23 hour Manchester Wizz Air 6X Client Flight Level 210 Direct to Britain's Park United, one, two, three, maintain two, eight, zero knots. London to DME, turn right onto Bravo, link. Do one, join Alpha, hold at Mora. Speedbird 472, LOC slash DME, approach runway 27 left. Follow the green stand 544. That's another.
and off air traffic control for today, Nat. Bedtime. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to fly a commercial passenger jet? Looked up at the sky and thought, I wish that was me? Well, now anyone has the chance to have a go at flying in a real aircraft simulator. NP Simulations and Flight Experience London, the only official Boeing licensed product of its kind in the UK, offer you the chance to fly anywhere in the world in their fixed base Boeing 737 800 Flight Simulator. And that's not all. Ground School London offers many different courses for the up and coming pilot looking for a start in aviation. With prices starting at just £109, the sky's the limit. So, for the ultimate flight simulator experience or engaging preparatory courses, including those for schools and colleges, check Check out the websites at www.london.flightexperience.co.uk and www.groundschoollondon.com or call on 020 300 40 616. NP Simulations. Fly your dreams. As always, Nev, excellent work on that video. Oh, thank you. Very kind of you. <laughs> yeah, it was great. And uh, as I said before, the, the enthusiasm of these gentlemen that we had the opportunity of speaking to was, yeah. was, uh, was brilliant. And of course, everybody at Bunting thought was very generous with their time. So yeah. we just turned up and, you know, asked them to speak about their, uh, their aircraft and what have you. Just yeah. to re uh, recap that the uh, website that you can go to for the Lightning Preservation Group is at uh, lightnings.org. Dot uk that's lightnings.org.uk and uh, lots of information on there about the aircraft. definitely yeah yeah worth a look uh, as i say there's some fascinating stuff at uh at bruntingthorpe and uh, i know you guys were well looked after when you had a good day yeah it was and uh yeah it was very warm as well but uh no we managed to uh, dodge the showers and uh, yeah it was great great time really good and we've got a couple more interviews left to run as well i think so uh, yeah looking forward to doing some more of those but, uh, Absolutely. um so next up it's the uh, just before you um, move on as i'm famous for doing um yes. speaking of uh, it was the cold war jets day at Bruntingthorpe, yeah yes okay um and the hotel next door to where i'm staying they have in their car park a cold war jet um, I'm going to guess that it's of Soviet era. Um, so I meant to take a photo today, but I didn't get a chance. Now, I've got no idea what it is, but um, okay. on my Twitter feed tomorrow, I'll take a photo of it, shove it up, mm -hmm. and I'd be grateful if someone could identify it because it literally is just in the car park. Really? Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, so that'll be quite good. And as an aside to that, um, earlier this week, I was in Kiev, and for anybody who's really interested in military aeroplanes, as you know, I'm fascinated. Of course, them. yes, absolutely. You love your great um, stuff, yes. <laughs> there is, at the airport at Kiev, a very, very good-looking uh, military museum. And okay. they have all sorts of stuff there that I haven't got the faintest idea what it is. <laughs> but um, um, you, you, if... You, you uh, might learn something. <laughs> if... Um, the uh, the the listeners who are interested in that sort of stuff uh, are struggling to find somewhere to go, then it looks like you can have an absolute veritable feast of military stuff at uh, Kiev. Wow. And uh, the same is actually true of uh, Riga. I don't know if you've flown into Riga before and uh, uh, parked up on one of the remote stands, but the, um, they've got a really interesting museum uh, that you can kind of see behind a hedge but um you can see it from the airport and i think that's open to the public as well i think there's a uh i think there's an airport museum there it's a, a military wow. airport museum in riga in latvia mm. as well so that that's another place that has uh, one in the airport indeed well while we're talking about the military shall we um shall we do just that I think, yeah. I think we're ready for it, aren't we? Yeah, I think we are. Let, let, let's do it. Uh, he says he's, uh, he's, he's frantically pressing buttons here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Uh, no, no, that's the credits. I don't want to play that one. Uh, oh, dear. Here we go. We're off. Hey! <laughs> so slick. So slick. <laughs> do you think they'll notice? <laughs> notice what? Indeed. <laughs> Uh, uh, Nev, I don't know, what do you reckon? Should we get Al to read all three of these stories? <laughs> As he's the military expert, we could do, couldn't we? Yeah, really? Absolutely, yeah, okay. Grey thing makes noise. 
<laughs> right, okay. <laughs> Spent. Okay. Is that all three of them? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Nev, uh, perhaps... We, we, will, we will crack on. <laughs> yeah, sure, we are, sure. This, yeah, so the first one's on uh, flightglobal.com, and we do like Flight Global. We do. Uh, and it says that Bell Boeing was awarded a 4.2 billion contract uh, dollar contract from the U.S. Navy to produce 78 V-22 Ospreys, the third multi-year purchase of the VTOL aircraft. The fixed price incentive fee contracts pays for 39 CMV-22B aircraft for the USN uh, and 34 MV-22B for the Marine Corps, uh, one CV-22B for the Air Force and four MV-22B aircraft for the uh, Japan Self-Defense Forces. This multi-year production contract provides program production stability through to at least 2024, says Chris Gaylor, Bell Vice President for the V-22 program. The third multi-year contract for Bell Boeing was not a foregone conclusion for the joint venture, but now that it is assigned, the manufacturer is guaranteed work for years to come, and in return, the US Navy is rewarded for its bulk purchase with a price reduction. They'll use the CMV-22B for transporting personnel and cargo from shore to aircraft carriers, eventually replacing Grumman C2A Greyhound, a twin-engine turboprop cargo aircraft, which has been in service since the mid-1960s. The V-22 Osprey entered service in 2007 with the USMC and the Air Force Special Operations Command in 2009. The aircraft has seen action in war zones in Afghanistan and Iraq as troop and cargo transports, though they have been used in humanitarian missions as well. The V-22 can carry 24 troops or up to 20,000 pounds of internal cargo. The VTOL aircraft maximum cruise speed is 266 knots it's always a fascinating looking aircraft isn't it this one it uh, is I, I i just i mean we're lucky enough that we uh, do you know have a friend of the show that, that that flies one of these things and they're just the most amazing thing aren't they they really are mm. just can't get yeah. enough of them they're just fantastic yeah. aren't they does do, do, do they do anything for you at all al anything <laughs> no right <laughs> fair enough <laughs> Okay, uh, right. Okay, I'll get, we'll move on to the next story then. And this yeah, I mean, is—they they look like someone had two completely different ideas and just like, oh well, I'll stick them together and see what happens. And see but isn't it that such not. a marvel of engineering, though? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, a feat of engineering. A marvel of engineering, or just a freak? I mean, right. <laughs> okay, yeah, we'll go with a marvel of engineering. Yes. Oh dear. <laughs> oh. Anyway, moving on. Uh, the Forces Network, uh, forces.net, is the next website. And the headline is the F-35B makes first visit to RAF Valley. So the aircraft will begin flying missions next year. The history was made at RAF Valley as the UK's first supersonic 30 F-35B Lightning II jet visited the station. The 617 Squadron aircraft F flew the fifth generation fighter to Valley from its home base at RAF Marham. Uh, the jet will be used by the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy on land and sea for the next generation with the first four aircraft operating from RAF Marham following their arrival from the United States last month. Uh, the combat aircraft will work alongside the Typhoon and has multi-role machine capabilities of conducting missions including air to surface, uh, electronic warfare, intelligence gathering and air to air simultaneously. The RAF will utilize the jets in missions from early 2019 after the current training concludes in the US. RAF Valley is currently the home of advanced fighter pilot training and future graduated from the 4th Squadron who will go on to fly the F-35 and the Typhoon fighter jets. Very exciting. Absolutely. Now, that, where, this RAF Valley, where is this one? I'm sure I saw stories this week where there was, I think, we did we cover it last week, where they, we got these, these low-flying aircraft in the valleys? Exactly. And you Indeed. We were, above actually, them. we were actually yeah, after you last Hunt week. Yeah, that's what and, uh, and uh, uh, valleys on Angsi, so uh, uh, not quite in the same, but no, in the okay. same country at least. I, well, uh, that's progress for me, Al. I'm not going to lie. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, my my Welsh valleys and my you know my my, my Welsh is uh, disappointing at best when it comes to my Welsh geography. But it is a a beautiful. I've only ever been to Aberystwyth, and even and and, I, and that was lovely. So I really should. Uh... Okay, well, my Hunslet is very close to Aberystwyth. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's good. Yeah. 
far enough from this part of the world, certainly, but then I suppose anywhere is far away from, from yeah, here. This is the back beyond, to be honest <laughs> yeah, with yeah, you. It is the back of beyond, isn't it? Uh, okay. And so I'm from Ireland. <laughs> well, yeah, I should know. Yeah, yeah, fair point. Yeah, absolutely. So who's going to take the last military story? Oh, then? it can't be military without Captain Al taking well, a story. Well, that's true, yes. Yeah. So you can have the last story. Oh, do I need to, I need to take one for the team? You do. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. it did. Again, it seems. Uh, okay, this is... Uh, uh, this is uh, the, the one from the star. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. Oh. Okay. <laughs> wow. Another quality right, publication okay. then. Yeah. Okay. It's just loading it up. So, uh, yeah, this will be from the star. Now, I'm presuming that this is not the national star unless this will be some sort of local star. So I'm just uh, agreeing to the cookies. And, uh, <laughs> mm, right. Okay. Well, nice. Is this the Rotherham star by any chance? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay. An RAF veteran from Rotherham who was part of the Dambusters has once again taken flight with thanks to an officer from the South Yorkshire Police and his friends. John Watkins, who sounds very Welsh to me, aged 94, is an RAF veteran who met officers from the Rotherham Central NHP and Armed Forces Day. He had lived in Rotherham all his life and joined the Royal Air Force in 1942. During his service to King and Country, he served with 617 Squadron, better known as the Dambusters. Sergeant Kirkham, who was ex-forces, met him on the day and enjoyed the stories he had to tell about his service. Thanks to two generous friends of his, who happened to own a Second World War Tiger Moth from the same year as John joined the Royal Air Force, Sergeant Kirkham managed to get John flying again over his former base. A Facebook post by Rotherham Central NHP said, Sergeant Kirkham was a little choked, but of course he thinks it was probably hay fever. John's <laughs> nickname is Snogger Watkins. Yeah, he's definitely Welsh. <laughs> Sergeant Kirkham <laughs> said, what a character he is, and it was an honour to be able to sort out this little adventure for him. John defended this country during war to allow people the freedom to live freely. And this is just a small way to show him how much we appreciate what he did. South Yorkshire Police is committed to supporting veterans like John and those who find themselves struggling with the help of Project Nova UK. Well, fantastic and well done, Rotherham Central NHP. Now, does anyone know what NHP stands for? Have we got a clue on this? No. No, I mean, it's obviously one. some sort of aspect of uh, the police force, but yeah. uh, anyway, uh, well done to those chaps, and it looks as if uh, good old Snogger's having a good time there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> a nice feel-good story, isn't it? We've had, we've had a few of those with the old military, and it's, I, I'm, yeah. really, I'm really looking forward to this big fly pass that they're making a big, a big deal out of. I, I really can't wait. It's going to be uh, great. I, I'm, I'm sort yeah, of hoping to try soon, and get to it? London to, to actually see some of it, but... Uh, yeah, it's gonna be yeah. uh, it's gonna be great to see so many. Uh, we had sort of a, a bit of a pre preview prequel to it, I suppose, when we went to Duxford recently because it was just so amazing to see so many Spitfires all in the air together, all at the same mm. time. It was just you know uh, just the whole. I suppose we've seen it in dribs and drabs, but to have everything all together and especially flying over central London, flying over Buckingham Palace and things. I mean, that's you know the logistics involved in that. You know, I mean, air traffic control are gonna have a mission. You know, to to try and get that, which I know we covered a few weeks ago, didn't we? Because yeah, I think they're did, actually yeah. they're actually gathering over Southwold, aren't they? That's uh, they're actually gathering locally to 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 sort of head out towards London, I think, aren't they? Sorry. Yeah, uh, 11, yeah. So it, it'll begin yeah. to form over Suffolk to the west of Ipswich around twelve forty-five, yeah. and then skirt towards the out uh, the south of Ipswich, travelling in a southwesterly direction towards Colchester. Pass uh, over north of Colchester, heading towards uh, Marks Tay, uh, Kelvedon, and Witham. Uh, before Kel passing Kelvedon, <laughs> that's the one. Kelvedon, <laughs> that's yes. the one. Honestly, wow. <laughs> wow. Yes, indeed. Yes. Um, Honestly, the Irish they come here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, Actually, can I read the military stories again next time? Because it's fascinating reading these military stories because uh, later on in that, that article in the Star, it says violence erupts at South Yorkshire Working Men's Club 
after woman attempts to give punter a massage. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think that's a different story there. <laughs> yeah, slightly, slightly off topic. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, I mean, it, it's fascinating how the, these, these military stories just evolve. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's taken an unusual turn, hasn't it? Um, uh, well... Uh, <laughs> Okay. Uh, Go back to that uh, 100, uh, 100 year fly fast. Just if you yes. were. Sorry, uh, I mean, I <laughs> no, 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 no. Just, myself, just uh, in case people were wondering uh, when that is, that will take place on July the 10th. Uh, so <laughs> okay. it'll be uh, at the mile, uh, getting towards Buckingham Palace around 1 pm. Oh. Uh, but yeah, on the July 10th. Well, actually, Matt and I might see some of that because we'll be we doing might. some editing in Hertfordshire. We will. On Tuesday on of Tuesday, next week. Yeah. So uh, we might have some stuff flying over where we are. We might well do. Yeah. That is a good point. Get the I mean, it's as if the weather's going to be glorious for it. Mm. But yeah. if it happens to be cloudy and raining, then I'd head to the Highgate Sports and Social Club in Rotherham because there'll be other entertainment. <laughs> 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 well, that, yeah, that, is, that is indeed true. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, as it so happens, I, I think that... Uh, just for a change, the British weather is going to do the right thing and uh, yeah. give all of the guys that have done oh. all of the exceptional hard work in yeah. planning this. Yeah. And, uh, of course, the Air, the Air Force must uh, you know, have at least 150 air aircraft that they can attempt to get 100 of them you know, airborne. Yeah. Because if they start with 100, they're never going to get 100 in the air. So they're going to no. have to have a couple of... 50 yeah. or so spares yeah. just to get the hood up <laughs> just to get the numbers up right okay it's slightly controversial well i mean i mean, it, I mean it, it, it it's fact because um uh, unfortunately a few years ago well, one of my friends who's ex air force passed away and uh, some of his uh, former squadron colleagues organized for uh, a three ship of tornadoes to do a flyby oh, wow. um, of uh, the cemetery um, and uh, yeah it was a three ship but only one of them got into the air oh, no. and uh, and they actually did a flyby of the wrong cemetery but oh, that's no. <laughs> You, you could write it oh, out. You could dear. write it, could you? Uh, I mean, yeah. the, the, the weather has been exceptional here in the UK. I mean, you should. I mean, uh, people who are in my garden here at the moment can see how dead my grass has become as yeah. a result of, yeah. of the weather. That is true. So, you don't have a lawn anymore. You've got. Um, yeah, it's a sort of a brown like, uh, sort yeah. of mud. Well, I don't know what it is. It's it, it dusty. Looks, it looks like a brown carpet. Yes, indeed. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, yes. You've not stood in the Jack Russell's. Um... Uh, no, I had a good, I had a good poo pick before we started. Actually, if we, uh, but enough about my personal no, I mean, problems. Yeah. Going back to the hundred fly pass, I mean, it will be a sensational sight, and I just hope that um, it's not too hazy because mm. you know we are kind of getting to that point now yeah. where uh, we've had this weather for so long. Yeah. But it will be brilliant if the weather is fantastic, and it'll it will be an absolute reward for all of the guys and girls that have planned all this. Yeah. Because, funnily enough, it's not just thrown together the night before. No. Shall we get, no, get no, 100 no. aeroplanes up into the sky and let's go and buzz the palace? Mm. And not well, only it, for the people that, yeah. uh, that were planning this, but all for, so for, for the people that it uh, represents and the people that it honours as well. Yeah. There's 100 years of some really hard work uh, done mm. by the uh, men and women at the RAF. That's going to be brilliant. There's going to be... Yeah. Uh, well, and also... Let's not forget, I mean, the hard work of the various air traffic controls, because, I mean, there's going to be multiple That's towers. True. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, you very know, true. It's, uh, I, ca I cannot imagine the logistics involved in, in you know, everything sort of... I mean, obviously, the route has been planned, and presumably they've had a say in the, in the chosen route uh, heading for London, I, I, I'm i assuming, but... Uh, well, the actual yeah. route is, it hasn't been released for security reasons, but, um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure true. they have... Uh, they have <laughs> Uh, decided on a route, uh, but the the aircraft that are currently lined up to uh, to be in the fly past includes some of them uh, from the Battle of Bit Britain Memorial More flight, flight including yeah. the Dakota, Lancaster, Hurricane, Spitfire, uh, and there's some modern ones as well, including the Hercules Atlas uh, A400M, C17, uh, the BA146, uh, Sentinel Voyager, a Shadow. I don't know what a Shadow is. Uh, a Rivet Joint. I think that's how they put the aircraft together. Caused by the sun. An E3D Sentry, a tornado, typhoon, and the red arrows as well. Yeah, I mean the red arrows are always good value, aren't they? I mean they they were amazing when they came to Yarmouth recently, didn't they? I mean that was good. And if any of the the British listeners and viewers are looking up at the skies of London, 
and uh, count them and see that there's 102 aircraft in the sky. That's because Pip and I will have chosen to join right. them. <laughs> Fair enough. That'll be nice in your little, in your little Piper 28. That'll and be that'll nice. be your uh, yeah. time yeah. in the military. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that'll be a story to tell. It, yeah, sure. It'll be a plane talk in the UK. Excl- it'll be a plane talk in UK <laughs> exclusive. There we are. That's that's great news. Uh, actually, while we're talking about fly-ins and, and barbecues and, and things like that, well, we won't talk about barbecues, but I'm obsessed by food, so that's that's how it goes uh so it's august the 18th saturday august the 18th don't forget we have our first ever fly-in barbecue that is being very kindly hosted by seeding owen's not actually going to be able to make it now. no i'm not going to be able to make it but um, honestly he's going to warmer story. climbs honestly it's all right for some uh but uh yes yeah, so there's going to be uh, don't forget as i say it's august saturday august the 18th um and uh, everybody is welcome to attend uh, but what we do need from you is you need to email the show uh, so it's podcast at plain talking uk.com that's podcast podcast at plaintalkinguk.com to let us know whether you're flying in or whether you are going to drive in. You can do both, uh, but we do need to let seeding know numbers. We need to know vehicle registration place, etc. for security reasons because uh, you are being invited airside. So, uh, yes, so anybody who wishes to participate and come, more than welcome to, as I say, podcast at plaintalkinguk.com. Uh, but we do need you to know, uh, we do need the registration plate of your aeroplane if you're, you're uh, coming. What are you? you lot up to over there you you haven't got a ready number on your blo- bike okay right fair enough and uh, and obviously it's the regi- registration of the aircraft just so that we can uh, let everybody let basically um ground control know who's coming and then also uh, if you're coming by car that's also fine but uh, obviously the registration plate and number of occupants would be appreciated podcast okay at plain talking uk.com haven't got a car but i think they're just stealing one on the day if they just text us when they've nicked it then <laughs> right. we'll sort it out okay. from there yeah yeah okay Fair enough. Uh, that's always an option, I suppose. Uh, uh, Nev. Uh, uh, I, I <laughs> suppose the other option is for uh, for Dr. Steph to just parachute in. That's the other option. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. parachuting is the way forward. Um, Pip okay. in the chat room is just saying he still has one or two spare seats oh, cool. available in his aircraft, in his yeah. PA-28. If okay. uh, anyone would like to contact Pip, then yeah. um, please do so because he's yeah. got some uh, got some space available still. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. I, I don't because by the time that I've picked Never, yes. um, the airplane's yeah. overweight. Right. <laughs> oh, how very rude. <laughs> Indeed. Yes. So well, it's a com- combined effect of me, me and Never. Uh, You're right. Have, okay. you know, yes. So. yes. I should just clarify uh, the amount of chicken nuggets that you're being No, no, ready. no, it's got nothing to do with chicken nuggets. It, it, and it, everything to do with the amount of marvellous equipment that uh, Nev is going to bring with him to ensure that we get a good you know, good record of the day, basically. So, uh, yes, yeah, so it's not because Nev has eaten too many pies. Oh, well, I uh, think it might be there. Uh, we'll, we'll go easy on it. Go easy on it. So, <laughs> let's just hope the weather plays nicely. That's the yeah. Way uh, yeah. yeah, fingers crossed. That's the only thing that's going to spoil it for us, really, isn't it? Is, it, is if the, uh, the weather is awful. I mean, one would like to think think that in August one could guarantee that um, the weather would be good but of course this is the United Kingdom and nothing is it's sacrament or promised <laughs> yes exactly yeah indeed okay well uh, guys I think that's where we need to bring the show to a close yes it's been a really good show again thanks to everybody for contributing thanks Al for all your uh, excellent interjections and comment which is <laughs> they're my new normally... sponsors my new sponsors right I- I've ditched the Hilton <laughs> right no good anymore. Right. Jerk off is the way to go. Right, OK. <laughs> and on that bombshell, I think that's where we need, before Nev wets himself, I think it's time to bring the show to a close. So thanks very much for participating. Everybody say goodbye, goodbye! Bye, Bye. guys. Bye.